<clears throat> this year, 2020, there has been so much crazy going on. I mean, so many things have been disrupted. Industries, especially those that work directly with people or serve large groups of people, have been severely impacted. The movie industry in particular has been hard hit, and as I'm scrolling through on my phone the, the news feed, I see tons of headlines about delayed plans for these superhero movies that are so ubiquitous in our culture today. They have years of movies planned out. It's Disney, and, and well, primarily Disney, but there's others that have this whole slate of movies that are planned out based on what was normal movie going. There's no new normal yet. We're still working out what that looks like. And so they're, they're left in limbo. But how did these movies get so popular in the first place that they would have years of film planned out in advance? Now, I think a big part of the appeal is that we love origin stories, the, the beginnings of a hero, if you will. And I think that most of us enjoy a good origin story, whether we like superheroes or not. I mean, maybe your superhero is the great one or a big time entrepreneur, someone who's done something exceptional or is recognized in an exceptional way. It might be the origin story for you might be the details of the humble origins of a caped man, or it might be a biopic going into the everyday life of a royal. Some of the most popular stories that we love, they, they explore our shared humanity with these larger than life people. And I think origin stories are particularly effective in establishing that shared humanity that we have, because oftentimes the beginnings show someone who is normal, or, or at least they, they th think they're normal at that point, but then due to a unique set of circumstances or a particular decision, that person is transformed into something absolutely exceptional. Spider-Man gets bitten by a radioactive spider. Um, the Henry Ford, he, he gets this idea to apply the concept of interchangeable parts to automobiles. Wayne Gretzky steps onto the ice at two years old. It's a simple thing compared to the rest of their story. So last week we talked about how important discipleship is. I mean, we all need to be discipled. It doesn't matter if you just started thinking about following Jesus or you've been following Jesus for decades. You need discipleship. You need to be discipled. And as we're growing as disciples, as we hear the stories of other disciples, there are certainly some, some superheroes, some larger than life individuals that should come to mind. Uh, today we're going to look at just two of the origin stories for the, the first disciples, the twelve apostles that were closest to Jesus as he walked on this earth. And they really, uh, they spearheaded the leadership of the early church in a tremendous way. You can read about it in Acts. Paul, he refers to them somewhat derisively as the so-called super apostles. Go ahead and turn with me to the book of Matthew. Uh, start out in Matthew chapter 4. Uh, we're going to read Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, and then we'll read Matthew 9, 9. So Matthew 4, 18 through 20. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, Jesus saw two brothers, Simon, who is now called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets, and they followed him. Matthew 9, 9, as Jesus passed on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he rose and followed him. So I want to draw attention to three things here first. First off, these are our everyday roll up your shirt sleeves sort of people. Second, there's, there's an immediacy to the reaction that they've just made. And third, remember, this is just a snapshot from their life. So first, there's this idea that the, the apostles are very accessible. And by that, I mean that these are everyday people, white collar and blue collar workers when we first meet them. They aren't the educated elite. They aren't the spiritually elite. They aren't the moneyed elite. They have no particular power in their society, and yet they aren't incredibly poor either, financially or intellectually. They were fishermen 
and yet they were also fishermen. Their father had hired men to help them. They had a, a family business, so to speak. Matthew here is a tax collector. Uh, he certainly had more means than the fishermen, and yet this was a position that wasn't restricted based on his birth. And in fact, it was a profession that was oftentimes looked down on by most of Matthew's Jewish peers. He was hated. By first century standards, these are pretty common men from common families. And yet over the course of about three years with Jesus, we come to know men that today we recognize that they shaped the world perhaps more than any other small group in history. The fact that God chose and used men such as these, that should be a clear indication to you and me that God can use us. God can use you. God can transform you, not because of who you are, because of your identity in society, but because you have been created in God's image. God knows you on a deeper level than you or anyone else that you've ever known can possibly hope for. Now, second, the apostles here are making a decision immediately to follow Christ, and it has immediate consequences. I mean, I just I love reading and rereading about how these disciples chose to follow Jesus when he chose them, when he called them. In my own walk with Jesus, there have been times where he's, he's asked me to follow him, and I've, I've dragged my feet, and I've come to regret it. But when my discipleship really started to become real, to really take off, is when I decided to jump in, to rush ahead. And that's the moment that we see these disciples in. Later on in Matthew 16, verses 24 through 25, Jesus is explaining to the disciples about the decision that they and, and others who would follow him would have to make. Go ahead and turn there with me now. Matthew 16, uh, verses 24 through 25. Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Jesus isn't cornering them at a conference or a rally. He's not talking to them in the synagogue on Saturday after a wonderful worship service, trying to convince them to follow their heart in that time when they'd be most likely to verbally agree. That's not Jesus' style. Instead, he, he meets them at their work. Jesus comes to them when what they would be giving up is most evident. I mean, if anything, with these three disciples, this should be the hardest time for them to walk away. And yet we get the sense that Simon, we're going to know him as Peter and Andrew and, and also Matthew, they step forward immediately and recognize that Jesus is offering everything that they have ever truly needed, everything that they have ever really wanted. And so they, they walk away from the family business. They walk away from their personal success. They walk away from the closest thing that they've known to a secure future to become a disciple, a student, who's going to study the teachings and model their life after this particular teacher, Jesus. They've made a decision here to follow Jesus in a radical way. Finally, I want to point out that this is Again, just a snapshot of that decisive moment in their lives. These three men made a tremendous decision that shaped the entire rest of their lives. It shaped the entire rest of humanity's future. What we're not given here is a picture of all the little decisions, all the little things that God had done in their lives already up to that point so that they would be ready to recognize and accept the truth that was walking in front of them. It's a snapshot, too, when we, we stop, we recognize all the growth. Now we know all the growth that would happen after they made that decision, all the transformation that would happen, but they had no comprehension of it yet. They don't know what's ahead for them completely. This is a moment in time. The soil's been prepared for the future. The soil's been prepared for this decision, and the seed is going to be planted right in this moment. And we can anticipate that future growth. Turn to John chapter 12, verse 24 through 26. And here we, we see this theme of, of valuing our life on earth less and setting our heart towards God really developed. 
Jesus said, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Now, verse 25, right in the middle there, it gets quoted on its own so often because it's, it's really extreme. And it's something that, if you're paying attention to it anyways, there's a real need to wrestle with that idea. Jesus here, he's using a favorite technique of, of Semitic philosophy and poetry to compare extremes. I mean, to the point where we, we have some hyperbole going on. But we, we sit here and we scratch our heads and we say, God, what do you mean? I, I've got to hate my life. I, didn't you give me this life? We can get so caught up in the drama of that word hate in verse 25 that it's easy to miss that Jesus already explained exactly what he means in verse 24. When Jesus talks about hating life, he's speaking specifically in reference to the analogy between a single grain giving up its life to produce new life. So we talk about hating our life. We're talking really about the difference between a farmer who hates his seed so much that he plants it in the ground so it can actually become a crop. He wants the seed to accomplish its purpose. I mean, can you imagine if there was a farmer who, who loved his seed so much, he loved his grain so much that he just kept it stored up forever in, in his silos. He never went out and planted it. What, what would be the point? Can that man even call himself a farmer? In the same way, we, we have to hate our life because we know that this life, this world, it's not the end. It's not the point. The purpose of this life is, is preparation for the eternal life that God has created us for. We must focus on living the life that God originally created us for. Uh, you see, when Adam and Eve first sinned, the world was dramatically changed by that decision to turn against God, to seek their own good instead of the good that God had prepared for them. The Bible tells us that from that moment forward, that the world has known sin and death, but God in his wisdom and mercy, he didn't abandon us to that spiritual death that happened in the garden. Instead, he left us with a seed. Apart from Jesus, the life that we have the seed that we've been given is inert. It's unable to truly change for the better without the transformation that comes from following Jesus. If we truly understand what God has given us, then we will give it back to him to be planted in the soil that he has prepared, to be watered and cared for by his son Jesus as we follow him. In that discipleship relationship, we have real growth. We have the opportunity for real change in our life according to the plan that God has set out from the very beginning. But still, we, we try to hold on to this life. We, we seek to find our identity or our own relative truth, our own good in the things that this world values. I want to look at it a different way. Let me throw this in for the kids. When Jesus tells us that we ought to hate our own life so that we can gain eternal life with him, he's saying that we should enter into our, our true purpose. It's kind of like if you remember the second Toy Story movie. There's this toy that never makes it out of the packaging. No kid has ever played with the toy. And that toy ends up so confused about what it actually means to be a toy. I mean, can you imagine if you had a toy that you love so much that you just set it up on the shelf? You never let anybody play with it. You never actually touched it because you wanted it to always be just the way it was. What's the point? Let's put it another way, going back to Jesus' seed analogy. If you go to the store and you to buy seeds to plant a gardener, maybe you're not a gardener, maybe you've walked by the seeds on your way to get something else, but you've seen all those packets lined up with the pictures of what the plants will be if you plant the seeds properly. They never look quite as good in my garden, but you know. You probably know, or, or at least have a decent guess, that the package is designed to protect the seeds uh, from 
taking root at the wrong time. You don't want the seeds to grow in the bag. So while the seed stays in the package, there is going to be no growth. The seed is going to remain unchanged. And then for all intents and purposes, that seed is, is dead. I mean, it's not biologically dead, but it's dead in the sense that it's, it's not growing. Probably not the best idea, but I, I buy cheap seed packets and they don't have as many seeds in them and they have these little folds at the bottom of the package and when I go to pour out, especially the smaller seeds like the radish seeds or some of the other small seeds, they get stuck in the folds. Sometimes there's even a little bit of glue that holds the envelope together and, and the seeds are glued in there. And it's almost as though they don't want to come out of the package and they're, they're hung up on the wrapper. Most of the time, I don't even bother to dig those seeds out because I, I still have enough so that those seeds that are stuck in the package, they go unplanted. They never experience the life that's written on the outside of the bag. The picture that's depicted, what that seed is supposed to look like when it really experiences life. So I want to challenge you as we move in discussion. Are you holding on? to that wrapper of, of this life because you're so enamored with the seed packaging. I mean, it's a really pretty picture. So enamored with that, that you're not ready to really grow, to really come to life in the way that God has intended you to. I mean, sometimes we, we say that we're ready for a new life with Jesus, but our actions, they're telling a different story. What if we really said the things that we live? I mean, yeah, 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 Jesus, that, that sounds great. I'd love new life. I just want to get my 401k in order first. I just want to get my retirement squared away. Yeah, Jesus, I'd love to be a disciple, but I, I have so many responsibilities. I mean, my parents, my kids, I mean, I need to take care of these things first, right? Jesus, I, I want to follow you, but but let me get a a better financial foundation under me so that I can really focus on you down the road. I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd like to follow Jesus, but I need to figure out what this new normal actually looks like. COVID, it's really thrown me for a curve here. Maybe then, once I've got things figured out, Jesus. Or maybe you're looking at your life right now and you're looking at the picture on the package and you just can't believe it. You're saying, you know what, Jesus? I could never be that. Because, you know, I've got this, this problem in my life. And I, I know God has said that it's wrong. I mean, it's sin. But I like things the way they are. I'm comfortable where I'm at. So maybe, maybe just take part of me out of the package. I'll, I'll hold on to this. Thank you very much. Or Jesus, you know, it's, it's been a hard road from, from where I've been to where I am now. I'm bruised and broken. And, and maybe when I started out, when I first got put into the package, maybe I could have filled out, grown into being the, the person that you really meant me to be. But I just don't see it happening anymore. I'm too broken. Lies. Untrue. But we still get hung up on it. I mean, Jesus... I kind of like the way all these other packages look. I've spent so long on the shelf. Everyone else is sitting here on the shelf. Everyone else is, is telling me that this is who I should be. It's so neat and orderly here in our society, so predictable, secure, and safe. God, why would you take me away from everything like that to something that I, I can't know exactly how things are going to be? We live in a world that is temporary and we look to that same temporary world for security? I mean, how messed up is that? Jesus is calling us right now to step out of that contradiction and step into the life that God intended you for, that he created you for. And in times like these, I think that we're all inclined to listen at least just a little bit to what he has to say to, to respond to the call of the Holy Spirit. But this week, when you finish that big project at work or, or your boss comes and he tells you, you've done a great job. That's the moment that Jesus is calling you. Maybe not to walk off the job like the apostles, but to approach your life differently because you're now following Jesus first. When you get done with a, a long day, you're excited to spend time with, with friends or, or with your family. Jesus is calling you in that moment to be different, to be a disciple. Whatever you see this week, you are being called to be a disciple. The origin stories that we read today about the super apostles, this week, I want you to remember those and, and remember that those little decisions and the big decisions, 
that those could be your origin story as a follower of Jesus.